Hey everyone, welcome to week 16, day three. This is our composition week. By the way, this is an exercise that every single person can do. All you have to do is just pick your favorite movie, pause it, space bar, whenever you, know, you feel you're at a sequence that you really, really like, and just try and investigate why the way it was framed is actually helping the uh, tone of the story. So this is something that we all can do and it's super, super easy to do it. For today, I'm gonna investigate a movie and especially, specifically a sequence that influenced about five, six, seven years of my own painting. And I loved that I realized that it was this moment, this exact moment that eventually was the one catalyst that uh, spurred a ton of painting that I loved doing. So if you wanna see that, uh, you have to see uh, today's video. So I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Okay, let's get started. For today's painting, we're actually going to be studying one of my favorite, favorite films ever, uh, The City of Lost Children. I think it is one of my favorite films because it holds a sequence or a character, really, that I didn't realize it at first, but it became incredibly important for my painting. I was trying to figure out where the need to put a character that would echo itself, a sort of carbon copy of a character. For the longest time, I tried to understand where that need to put a twin character in my painting would come from. And I realized that there was a sequence in this movie that I had loved for years and years, where one of the villains, the octopus, which is, you know, the, this incredible character, which are uh, conjoined twins uh, united by one foot, that are the sort of owners of an orphanage where they use these children as thieves. So if you want to think about it, they are basically the uh, Fagin of Oliver Twist. <laughs> the underworld of this city is almost very Dickens Oliver Twist. So if you want to understand that world that way. And this character, because it is one character, even though they are two different people, but they are understood as one character. And the way they choreograph their movements is just absolutely magical. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that. Those magical motions of, of the hand gestures, of the arm gestures that that character has. And specifically, this screenshot comes from a second sequence where she's actually showcasing that because there's a first sequence where she's grabbing all the money and all the stuff that all the kids have pickpocketed uh, during the night. So this is the second sequence where she's actually cooking and it is fascinating because everything is just chaotically but beautifully choreographed. So even though they are behaving as if they are twins, you kind of start thinking about them as this one being that has four arms. And, you know, years later, because I think this was uh, this movie is 95, years later, I remember seeing Spirited Away. And one of the characters in Spirited Away, the uh, Kamaji, is pretty much that. There is unity in this character, but he is also like a spider kind of monster being, a human with like a spider form. So he has like eight arms. And one of the coolest things in that movie is just seeing this character kind of going through all these motions with his eight arms and being fully conscious of where every one of his eight arms is. And I think that the coming together of the character of City of Lost Children, the octopus, with the Kamaji, eventually, <laughs> I know this is, this is a, a weird melting pot, but eventually became the paintings that I did where a figure would echo uh, another figure and there was uh, almost countless repetition within the image. So there could be a same figure with four arms or there could be a mirror image of that figure, of that one figure that was inhabiting the same space. So you wouldn't really understand if it was like the octopus, if they were like conjoined twins or if it was just um, like a separate rhythm of the same figure. I really, really like that. And in my mind, I always felt like having two of the same would actually make things a lot easier. It would just make the effort in trying to understand how to portray uh, something that is unique a lot easier because now I had the ability to just say, well, there is no uniqueness. There's always going to be 
a copy, and if there is a copy, then I don't feel this weight of representation on my shoulders, and I can just echo forms or just add forms. And that, for some reason, just liberated me from so much weight, from so much baggage in terms of, of representation and being faithful to nature that I thought, oh, this is, this is the perfect path to go. But I remember trying to assimilate that I had to ground that decision of making these images, painted images, and understand that they had to have an origin in two-dimensional art also. So for the longest time, I tried to convince myself that it was maybe in Moybridge and in time-lapse photography where I found a lot of the um, influence that I needed to do my paintings. Or I also told myself, well, it is also in this, in one of the weirdest, you know, paintings of the 20th century, the uh, New Descending the Stairs Number 2 by Duchamp, which is a very, very strange, strange painting because it didn't really fit in anything. The Cubist painters even referred to that painting as not being quite Cubist, that it was much more futurist than Cubist. And Duchamp was loving it. Duchamp didn't really understand himself as, as an artist that would accommodate to any particular philosophy. So he was loving that this painting really oscillated between, between isms and people hated the painting for it. They didn't really understand what he was doing at that time. This was around 1913. So I always thought that was fascinating. It's a depiction of an action, but it's not concentrating on freezing that action which is something that painting usually did. It was trying to depict a single moment in time. The act of depicting an instant is absolutely impossible, and impossible for painting, and even more so when you're trying to paint from observation, from looking at nature. So trying to redefine the way painting could depict nature and motion was something that was incredibly fascinating at the beginning of the 20th century. So my brain always told me, well, you have to kind of ground yourself in painting to justify painting. But it was so amazing when I realized that my influence was actually probably closer to this sequence of this movie that I loved and these imaginary fantastical characters that I loved in animations rather than trying to say that it was part of this effort of this far more what appeared to be sophisticated effort that belonged to the tradition of painting. So I, I didn't feel bad when I was honest with myself and I told myself, well, you know what? I love that painting, that Duchamp painting. But whenever I see that sequence of the octopus cooking, it's just fascinating. To me, it's absolute magic. On the one hand, the painting is just incredible in the sense of the value that it has in terms of its place in painting history. But the other one, that this, this small sequence in the movie, is just something that baffled me and I was enamored by immediately. And I realized it wasn't until years later, like I said, this movie was 95, I think uh, Chihiro, um, Spirited Away, was 2001, but I think it came to the, uh, to the West around 2002, maybe, three? So it was years later, years later, that I realized, okay, this has a place in my painting. I could actually start playing around with this. And I wasn't super interested in the beginning in trying to understand how I could speak about actions, about an infinity of actions that all these limbs, all these extra limbs would be doing. I was very satisfied with just acknowledging the fact that there was this universe where these two forms could actually inhabit this one space, this single space. And the fact that it didn't make sense, I absolutely loved because, like I said, it was very liberating. As soon as I accept it as a, a truth in the universe that I'm trying to portray, then the weight is off and then I can do whatever I want. That's why I, I usually tell people, once you accept that things can be off and things can be wrong, then you're not bound by anything. You can just make this universe your playground. And yes, you have to design it so it, in the wrongness, it still kind of makes sense. But you're not bound by the laws of nature, of the natural world. And you can do whatever you want. So in this sequence, in this particular sequence, 
it is a depiction of a cluttered mess. I mean, the kitchen has a ton of things and she's actually cutting vegetables and frying vegetables. And it's all so beautifully paced because there's so much stuff going on and you as a viewer feel like you're lagging behind. It's almost like you think you need an extra pair of eyes in order for you to see what they are seeing. Because in their world, in the octopus world, they are in complete control. Even though for us, it just seems like, like this chaotic thing. And we, I think, see it. We as viewers see her as the children would see her in the orphanage. As this complete monster. Because it is monstrous. I've always loved when art has the ability to do those things. It can actually stay grounded in a human experience. Um, you can connect with these characters at a level that you feel that they are human, but what you're seeing is absolutely inhuman. What you're seeing is something that is otherworldly and belongs to another place, another universe, but because there is such an effort to try and make things feel not foreign, but close to us. Because, you know, in essence, this is just a person cooking. And <laughs> and this is weird, but I always refer to that character as one character. In my mind, it's a person. It's not conjoined twins. They're not two characters. It's really one character. And I love the fact that even though they both have names, it is called the octopus. But you're seeing a character cooking, which is one of the most basic things ever. And she's in the center of this image, completely surrounded by a ton of objects. Uh, so there's tons and tons of information just glistening in the image, asking for your attention. But you're kind of entranced by the motions that are going on. So the intersection of all these hands and all these shapes and all these actions is right there in the middle of that image, just crying for your attention. And everything else is just this, this kind of noise but it's familiar noise, I feel, that grounds the whole sequence. So in many ways, it is kind of using the same elements that the screenshot that we did yesterday is doing. And even though uh, Wes Anderson always uses perspective and has a very specific focal point, which is usually right down the middle, this doesn't quite have that because we can't see those tangents that are pointing towards the middle. But everything, there's this sort of strange distortion, which is... Um, which is a motif in, in the whole movie. This this kind of weird distortion of you being like really on top of this character and all the actions that are happening at the same time. And the union of all those elements is what's actually bringing you closer to the center of that image, to again, the fantastical nature of that character. And like I said, when I saw it for the first time, I was absolutely entranced by it. It is still in my brain one of the most magical characters that I've ever seen in my life. And it was responsible for, I don't know, about 10 years of my painting. A lot of people still, when they refer to my painting, they actually speak about the fact that I did a bunch of paintings, I don't know, tens and tens of paintings, with a character with an extra pair of limbs where each pair of limbs was doing a separate action or where there were echoing characters throughout the image. But it was very, very static. I want to emphasize the fact that I didn't really need to depict a specific action. I was very comfortable portraying the acknowledgement of the possibility that these two characters, which are the same character, <laughs> could exist in the same plane, in the same reality. And just that was magical enough for me. And the fact that they could acknowledge their existence by merging at times and kind of becoming one and then slowly separating themselves was probably the most exciting thing for me. I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago when I started doing those paintings. So like I said, this was a great opportunity to examine that sequence again and to kind of understand how the way it was shot, the way it was framed, and the way all these arms were converging in the center of this image is actually something that moved me profoundly and that its influence, and this is probably the most important part, its influence was not immediate in my work. This was 95, this movie. And I don't think I started painting those paintings until maybe 2004, 2005. So 
if you think about it, it's like 10 years later, 10 years later, I was able to understand how to take all the things that I had loved from this one sequence, from this one character in this movie and, you know, bring it to painting and say, okay, if, if I were to invite all these influences into my painting, what would happen and what would that look like? So I was very, very happy that even though, yes, there's Sushant, yes, there's Moybridge, there is time-lapse photography, there's also this place where Spirited Away was as important as Duchamp, where the Kamaji character was as important as that new descending the stairs, and where the octopus was probably the quintessential character in all of this. And that sequence, this sequence that I'm portraying, was the one that influenced, like I said, years of my painting and made me understand that I could access a liberty with my work that I hadn't really understood before that because I was trying to work in a very naturalist manner. So any window, any opportunity that I could use to escape from traditional naturalist painting, from being faithful to nature, was something that I appreciated immensely. Just acknowledging that this was the moment where <laughs> where it all started just brings a huge smile to my face. So this is what we did today. By the way, this was um, same aspect ratio as we did yesterday with the uh, Wes Anderson movie with Moonrise Kingdom. We repeated the aspect ratio, the dimensions, but I felt it was necessary because it's a moment that's so important for me in terms of image making that it was important for me to go back and to look at it and to try and put together that image and to see how all these elements coming together were so powerful that they actually prompted me to do the painting that I did for many, many years. So that was it for today. Join us tomorrow for another exercise in composition. I think uh, Wes Anderson is going to make a comeback and we're going to have a completely different aspect ratio. So join us tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.